Hello my lovelies! Today I have another book haul for you, so stay tuned. So I have accumulated 64 books. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, but let's see. Some of these, like these here, came from subscription boxes. Uh, some of these were gifts. I think all of those were gifts. And then we've got a Katniss here. I've got ARCs, uh, books that I've bought, more books that I bought, some more gifts, some more books that I bought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of books this month. So let's just jump right in. I think I'm going to start with these right here. Uh, this whole stack here are books that my friend Kaylani was unhauling and I got to like pick through what she had and these are some of those. So the first one I have here is a manga called Fire in His Fingertips. A flirty fireman ravishes me with his smoldering gaze. And this says, Passion's ablaze. Rio tries to set up her strapping fireman friend, Suma, with a co-worker from her office, but her matchmaking efforts hit a brick wall. It turns out that Suma has the hots for Rio instead. And when a fire breaks out in Rio's apartment, it's Suma who comes to the rescue and the heat really gets turned up for the fiery couple. Cute. And then I have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. And I'm not going to explain what this is, uh, but this is just uh, a cute little version that she ha uh, got in a box or something and gave it to me. I have lots of Alice in Wonderland. Okay, next up is In a Dark Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. And let's see. Okay, so I filmed another video before filming this and <laughs> didn't change out my battery, so now it's flashing at me. So let me change that out and I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. So this does not have a synopsis on the back, so I've pulled it up on Goodreads. This says, in a dark, dark wood, Nora hasn't seen Claire for 10 years, not since Nora walked out of school one day and never went back. There was a dark, dark house until out of the blue, an invitation to Claire's Hindu arrives. Is this a chance for Nora to finally put her past behind her? And in the dark, dark house, there was a dark, dark room, but something goes wrong, very wrong. And in the dark, dark room, some things can't stay secret forever. Okay. Next up is the song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. And this one says, a tale of gods and goddesses, kings and queens, immortal fame, and the human heart. Achilles, the best of all the Greeks, son of the cruel sea goddess the Thetis and the legendary king Peleus, is strong, swift, and beautiful, irresistible to all who meet him. Patro Patroclus is an awkward young prince, exiled from his homeland after an act of shocking violence. Brought together by chance, they forge an inseparable bond, despite risking the gods' wrath. They are trained by the centaur Chiron in the arts of war and medicine, but when word comes that Helen of Sparta has been kidnapped, all the heroes of Greece are called upon to lay siege to Troy in her name. Seduced by the promise of a glorious destiny, Achilles joins their cause, and torn between love and fear for his friend, Patroclus follows, Little do they know that the cruel fates will test them both as never before and demand a terrible sacrifice. Okay, next up is Coconut Layer Cake Murder, a Hannah Swenson mystery with recipes by Joanne Fluke. And, uh, let's see. Hannah Swenson is like a baker and also kind of solves crimes in her local area and uh, the first one I read was super super cute I loved it and when I saw that Kehlani was getting rid of this one which is actually an arc I believe I, I, I had to snatch it up because I loved the first one okay then we have 
The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper by Phaedra Patrick. And this says, 69-year-old Arthur Pepper lives a simple life. He gets out of bed at precisely 7.30 a.m., just as he did when his wife Miriam was alive. He dresses in the same gray slacks and mustard sweater vest, waters his fern, Frederica, and heads out to his garden. But on the one-year anniversary of Miriam's death, something changes. Sorting through Miriam's possessions, Arthur finds an exquisite gold charm bracelet he's never seen before. What follows is a surprising and unforgettable odyssey that takes Arthur from London to Paris and as far as India in an epic quest to find out the truth about his wife's secret life before they met. A journey that leads him to find hope, healing, and self-discovery in the most unexpected places. Then there's Better Than Perfect by Simone Eccles. And this says, after getting kicked out of boarding school, bad boy Derek Fitzpatrick has no choice but to move with his ditzy stepmother back to her hometown in Illinois while his military dad is deployed. Derek's counting the days before he can be on his own, and the last thing he needs is to get involved with someone else's family drama. Ashton Parker knows one thing for certain. People you care about leave without a backward glance. So when her older sister comes home after abandoning her 10 years earlier with her hot new stepson in tow, Ashton wants nothing to do with either of them. Then she comes up with a plan that would finally give her the chance to leave, but it requires trusting Derek. Is she willing to put her heart on the line to try to get the future she wants? Next is Come Find Me by Megan Miranda. This says, how often the danger lurks inside our own homes. How often we let it inside. Six months ago, Kennedy Jones suffered a horrible family tragedy, and since then she's lived with her uncle, sneaking out only occasionally to visit her childhood home. Nearby, Nolan Chandler is determined to find out what really happened to his brother, who disappeared without a trace two years earlier. Then Kennedy and Nolan find themselves drawn together by strange signs for Kennedy, it's a disturbing pattern on her brother's radio telescope. For Nolan, it's a mysterious frequency coming from his brother's bedroom. When they realize their brothers also share dark pasts, they begin to wonder whether something is coming for them. Or are the signals a warning that something's already here? Then I have The Woman in Cabin 10 by Ruth Ware. And this says... In this tightly wound, enthralling story reminiscent of Agatha Christie's works, Lo Blacklock, a journalist who writes for a travel magazine, has just been given the assignment of a lifetime, a week on a luxury cruise with only a handful of cabins. The sky is clear, the water is calm, and the veneered select guests, jovial as the exclusive cruise ship, the Aurora, begins her voyage in the picturesque North Sea. At first, Lo's stay is nothing but pleasant. The cabins are plush, the dinner parties are sparkling, and the guests are elegant. But as the week wears on, frigid winds whip the deck, gray skies fall, and Lo hears what she can only describe as a dark and terrifying nightmare, a woman being thrown overboard. The problem? All passengers and crew members remain accounted for, and so the ship sails on as if nothing has happened, despite Lo's desperate attempts to convey that something or someone has gone terribly, terribly wrong. With surprising twists, spine-tingling turns, and a setting that proves as uncomfortably claustrophobic as it is eerily beautiful, Ruth Ware offers up another taut, taut and intense read in The Woman in Cabin 10, one that will leave even the most sure-footed reader restlessly uneasy long after the last page is turned. Then I have a graphic novel. This is Poe Stories and Poems. Uh, a graphic novel, novel adaptation by Gareth Hines. And let's see. Looks like this. Then I have Sea Spell by Jennifer Donnelly. This is the fourth book in the water fire saga and so i'm gonna i have the first three books but i don't want to get them off my shelf right now okay so the first book is called deep blue this says seraphina daughter of isabella queen of miramar 
has been raised with the expectation and burden that she will someday become ruler of the oldest civilization of the merfolk. On the eve of the Dokimi ceremony, which will determine if she is worthy of the crown, Sarah is haunted by a strange dream that foretells the return of an ancient evil. But her nightmare is forgotten the next day, as she diligently practices her song spell, eagerly anticipates a reunion with her best friend Neela, and anxiously worries about Mahdi, the crown prick prince of Matali, and whether his feelings toward her and their future betrothal have changed. Most of all, she worries about not living up to her mother's hopes. The Dokimi proceeds a dazzling display of majesty and might until a shocking turn of events interrupts it. An assassin's arrow wounds Isabella, the realm falls into chaos, and Serafina's darkest premonitions are confirmed. Now she and Neela must embark on a quest to find the assassin's master and prevent a war between the mere nations. Their search will lead them to other mermaid heroines scattered across the six seas. Together they will form an unbreakable bond of sisterhood as they uncover a conspiracy that threatens their world's very existence. Next up is Wolf by Wolf by Ryan Garodin. And this says, her story begins on a train. The year is 1956 and the Axis power of the Third Reich and Imperial Japan rule. To commemorate their great victory, they host the Axis Tour, an annual motorcycle race across their conjoined continents. The prize? An audience with the highly reclusive Adolf Hitler at the Victor's Ball in Tokyo. Yale, a former death camp prisoner, has witnessed too much suffering, and the five wolves tattooed on her arm always remind her of the loved ones she's lost. The resistance has given Yale one goal, win the race and kill Hitler. With the power to skin shift, Yale must complete her mission by impersonating last year's only female racer, Adele Wolf. But as Yale grows closer to the other competitors, can't she be as ruthless as she needs to be to avoid discovery and stay true to her mission? Next up is The Two Lives of Lydia Bird by Josie Silver. And this says, Two lives, two loves, one impossible choice. Lydia and Freddie, Freddie and Lydia. They'd been together for more than a decade and Lydia thought their love was indestructible, but she was wrong. On Lydia's 28th birthday, Freddie died in a car accident. So now it's just Lydia and all she wants is to hide indoors and sob until her eyes fall out. But Lydia knows that Freddie would want her to try to live fully, happily, even without him. So enlisting the help of his best friend Jonah and her sister Elle, she takes her first tentative steps into the world, open to life, and perhaps even love, again. But then something inexplicable happens that gives her another chance at her old life with Freddie, a life where none of the tragic events of the past few months have happened. Lydia is pulled again and again through a doorway to her past, living two lives, impossibly, at once. But there is an emotional toll to returning to a world where Freddie, alive, still owns her heart because there's someone in her new life, her real life, who wants her to stay. Written with Josie Silver's trademark warmth and wit, wit, The Two Lives of Lydia Bird is a powerful and thrilling love story about the what-ifs that arise at life's crossroads and what happens when one woman is given a miraculous chance to answer them. Okay, these five here are also books that uh, Kehlani was unhauling and I picked out. So the first one is... The Green Mile by Stephen King. I had the original set of these and it was like five or six little skinny books in a little box set. I had them when I was, I don't know, early teens maybe or middle school. And I absolutely loved it and I loved the movie. And she had this and was getting rid of it so I wanted to get it. This says, Welcome to Cold Mountain Penitentiary, home to the depression-worn men of E-Block. Convicted killers all, each awaits his turn to walk the Green Mile, keeping a date with old Sparky, Cold Mountain's electric chair. Prison guard Paul Edgecombe has seen his share of oddities in his years working the mile, but he's never seen anyone like John Coffey, a man with the body of a giant and the mind of a child. Condemned for a crime terrifying in its violence and shocking in its depravity, in this place of ultimate retribution, Edgecombe is about to discover the terrible, wondrous truths about coffee, a truth that will challenge his most cherished beliefs and yours. 
Oh, this is so good. Okay, these next three books are a trilogy, I believe. Uh, so the first one is Perfect Chemistry by Simone Eccles. And then I have book two, which is Rules of Attraction, and book three, Chain Reaction. So let me read about Perfect Chemistry. This says, at Fairfield High School on the outskirts of Chicago, everyone knows that Southsiders and Northsiders aren't exactly compatible elements. So when head cheerleader Brittany Ellis and gang member Alex Fuentes are forced to be lab partners in chemistry class, the results are bound to be explosive. But neither teen is prepared for the most surprising chemical reaction of all, love. Can they break through the stereotypes and misconceptions that threaten to keep them apart? All right, and then I think this is the last of the ones that Kehlani was unhauling. That is More Than Maybe by Aaron Hahn. This says, Growing up under his punk rocker dad's spotlight, 18-year-old Luke Greenlee knows fame and wants nothing to do with it. His real love isn't in front of a crowd, it's on the page. Hiding his gift and secretly hoarding songs in his bedroom at night, he prefers the anonymous comfort of the podcast he co-hosts with Cullen, his outgoing and meddling twin, who's in a fairy tale perfect relationship with Luke's best friend, Zach. But that's not Luke's only secret. He also has a major unrequited crush on music blogger Veda Carswell. Veda's got a five-year plan, secure a job at the Loud Lizard, to learn from local legend and her mom's boyfriend, Phil Josephs, check, take over Phil's music blog, double check, get accepted into Berkeley's prestigious music journalism program, check, 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 manage Ann Arbor's summer concert series, and a secure Rolling Stone internship. Luke Greenlee is most definitely not on the list. So what if his self-deprecating charm and out-of-this-world music knowledge make her dizzy? Or that his brother just released a bootleg recording of Luke singing about some mystery girl on their podcast and she really, really wishes it was her. In more than maybe Aaron Hahn's swooniest, swooniest book yet, Luke and Veda must decide how deep their feelings run and what it would mean to give love a try. And this sounds so cute. Let's see, I think I'm going to go with this right now. Okay, let me pull this little stack down on top of my head here. <laughs> so then after I went through Kehlani's books, we went to this used bookstore and she traded them in for credit. And with some of her credit, she actually, um, she got herself some stuff and she got me two graphic novels and she still had lots of credit left over. But the two graphic novels that she got me, I have Saga Volume 1 and Volume 2 and I've heard amazing things about these. Uh, let's see. This says, Saga is the sweeping tale of one young family fighting to find their place in the universe. When two soldiers from opposite sides of the never-ending galactic war fall in love, they risk everything to bring a fragile new life into a dangerous old world. Fantasy and science fiction are wed like never before in the first volume of this sexy, subversive, ongoing epic. And like I said, I've heard amazing things about this series, so when, I think... I think she was able to get them for like around three bucks each or something. So, or three dollars worth of credit. So I thought that was an excellent deal. Then I have a couple of books that I'm not sure if I showed these in my last book haul or not. Actually, now that I'm looking at these uh, three books here, I do believe I showed them in my last book haul because uh, I couldn't remember if I did or not, and so I was going to include them in this. But I'll just show you the title and author and not go into the synopsis because I I definitely did now that I've looked at them. Uh, but I have Listen to Your Heart by Casey West, Lucky in Love by Casey West, and Becoming by Michelle Obama. So, yeah. I guess technically you could say I only got 61 instead of 64. Because, yeah, I do believe I showed that one. And I may or may not have shown this one. I cannot recall. 
Uh, this was a birthday gift from my mother and that was Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. This is sort of a memoir of his about the opportunities he's had in life and, and how he just fully embraced them and just went for it. And my mom and I actually listened to the audiobook of this, which is narrated by Matthew McConaughey himself, and it was amazing. And there are pictures all throughout that I just really needed to see. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to have a physical copy of this book. And I imagine that I will reread it again in the future. Loved it. This was a five star book for me. Okay, uh, then here, I'll pull these down. These are all books that came from Y'all West, whether they were ARCs or books that I purchased. So the first four books are ones that I purchased. So I met this author, uh, Douglas J. Ebock. He wrote the original screenplay for the movie Sweet Home Alabama. I absolutely love that movie with Reese Witherspoon. Big fan of it. And he had these two books that I just walked by and they caught my attention because of the name. Uh, I don't see my name on a lot of things, like especially books. And the first one I saw is this one, Felony Melanie in Pageant Pandemonium. This follows the characters from Sweet Home Alabama, but it's in their teen years. Anyway, um, he had a deal going on where I think it was like $10 for one book or $25 for all three. And so I was like, well, I'll do the $25, thinking there were three Felony Melanie books. There were not. There were two Felony Melanie books and one other book. Uh, so I ended up getting all three of them. But the Felony Melanie ones, we have this one and Felony Melanie in the big smash up. And he actually signed these to the real Felony Melanie and I just, oh, so cute. So now that I think about it, I think I might have shown all of these in last month's haul too. I don't know, I can't remember. Uh, so I think one of them I didn't. But I'm just gonna tell you the names and authors and that's it for these just because I have a lot to get through anyway so I'll I'll link last month's haul up here or the last haul I did up here and you can go and see uh, and if I didn't list it there then you can look it up on Goodreads <laughs> so I have Felony Melanie in Pageant Pandemonium by Douglas J. Ebock and Felony Melanie in the Big Smash Up I also have by Douglas J. Ebock, Totally Rad Wormhole. And then by Mariko Tamaki, I got Cold. And then the arcs that I got while at Y'all West, I have How Maya Got Fierce by Sona Sher Sharapotra. The Summer of Bitter and Sweet by Jen Ferguson. The Stars Did Wander Darkling by Colin Malloy. Nothing More to Tell by Karen M. McManus. And We Deserve Monuments by Jan Hammonds. And then I also one an arc from one of their virtual things uh, and so they mailed it to me so this did come this month so i know i didn't show it in that haul and that is love radio by ebony liddell and this says prince jones is the guy with all the answers or so it seems after all at 17 he has his own segment on detroit's popular hip-hop show love radio where he dishes out advice to the brokenhearted prince has always dreamed of becoming a dj and falling in love but being the main caretaker for his mother who has multiple sclerosis and his little brother means his dreams will stay just that and the only romances in his lives are the ones he hears about from his listeners until he meets danny ford 
Danny isn't checking for anybody. She's focused on her plan. A senior year, score a scholarship, and move to New York City to become a famous arth ar ar ah, author. <laughs> Words. Uh, but her college essay keeps tripping her up. And acknowledging what's blocking her means dealing with what happened at that party a few months ago. And that's one thing Danny can't do. When the romantic DJ meets the ambitious writer, sparks fly. Prince is smitten, but Danny's not looking to get derailed. She gives Prince just three dates to convince her that he's worth falling for. Three dates for the love expert to take his own advice and just maybe change two lives forever. This sounds so good. Okay, let's see. These here are all gifts. Let me pull them down. So these first two were gifts from Kehlani. So thank you, Kehlani. Thank you for all of these books. <laughs> the first one is The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. And I've heard so many good things about this. And Kehlani says this is like one of her favorite books. So I'm very excited to read it. I've wanted to read this for a long time. This says... The circus arrives without warning. No announcements precede it. It is simply there, when yesterday it was not. Within the black and white striped canvas tents is an utterly unique experience full of breathtaking amazements. It is called Le Cirque de Reeves, and it is only open at night. But behind the scenes, a fierce competition is underway. A duel between two young magicians, Celia and Marco, who have been trained since childhood expressly for this purpose by their mercurial instructors. Unbeknownst to them both, this is a game in which only one can be left standing. Amidst the high stakes, Celia and Marco soon stumble headfirst into love, setting off a domino effect of dangerous consequences and leaving the lives of everyone, from the performers to the patrons, hanging in the balance. Oh, goodness. And then we have Extraordinary by V.E. Schwab. This is a graphic novel. I think it kind of goes uh, in the middle of Vicious and Vengeful. And the only thing I know about this series is that these two have learned that you can come close to death and gain superpowers. And so they, they keep doing this um, and kind of become like villains almost. Uh, but I love everything that V.E. Schwab writes, so I'm super excited to have this. Okay, these next six books all came from uh, my friend Nicole Bannister, and I will link her channel down in the description. So thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, she picked out a few things that were on my wish list and a couple of other things that I guess she thought I would enjoy. Uh, the ones that she selected off of my wish list, she got me Jim and the Holograms Infinite and Jim and the Holograms Dimensions. And I loved Jim and the Holograms growing up. Uh, how do I describe this? Jim is sort of a stage name for Jerrica and uh, she has like, uh, the holograms are her like adoptive siblings and they've made this band together and their father passes away and he was like this super smart guy and he made this whole AI program thing that they can use to make these holograms and stuff and Jerrica she's really really like has stage fright and so she creates Jim as sort of a persona that can go on stage and yeah it's it's so much fun and i loved it and uh i'm super excited to have those and then the others that she selected for me uh, i have noise which is based on a true story by kathleen raimundo and this is a little bitty graphic novel but it looks like super cute and let me see there's no synopsis on here so i'm pulling it up on goodreads this says, an introverted girl who just wants, wanted to be left alone. A talkative little boy with a very important wish. Based on a true story, Noise is the heartwarming tale of finding joy in unexpected places. Short and sweet, this is a full-color comic book for both children and adults alike. And then she also sent me Young Changemakers Making a Difference by Stacy C. Bauer. 
and illustrated by Emanuela Tamak. And this says, kids around the world are doing extraordinary things. Making a difference is filled with stories of kids who are making the world a better place by following their hearts and chasing their dreams. Whether planting over a billion trees, bringing joy through music, fundraising for sick children, or starting an inclusive dance team, these determined youth are using their talents to do amazing things. Packed with beautiful illustrations, color photos, and interesting facts, these inspiring stories prove that you're never too young to make a difference. And it looks like this. And then she got me the hardcover of uh, The Land of Stories, A Grim Warning. This is the third book in the Land of Stories series. And I do actually own the first three books in paperback. So I do have another copy of this one. Uh, but I've read the first book, absolutely loved it. Uh, these two kids fall into a book of fairy tales and they've got to try to figure out how to get out of it and it's they get to meet all the fairy tale, fairy tale characters and see them as like real people instead of just what they are in the stories and I, I love that kind of thing and then she also got me Phoebe and her unicorn by Dana Simpson and this says do you believe in unicorns Phoebe does she has no choice one day, she skipped a rock across a pond and hit a unicorn in the face. Improbably, this resulted in a lasting friendship between Phoebe and the unicorn, one marigold heavenly nostrils. Come along for the unicorn ride with Phoebe as she deals with the usual burdens of childhood, cruel cat classmates, gym class, piano lessons, and some unusual ones, magic hair, candy breathing dragons, and the legendary shield of boring boringness. Can a precocious little girl and self-absorbed mythical forest creature find common ground? Indeed they can, and that's how Phoebe and her unicorn unfolds. That sounds cute. And it looks like this. Okay, then we have, let's see, I'll go with this stack next. These are books that came in subscription boxes. So the first one I have is Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. And this has these pretty green sprayed edges. Looks like this. It has this reversible dust jacket. And the book looks like this. It's so very pretty. This says, The realm of Asnar has been cursed. Every new moon, magic flows from the nearby mountain and brings nightmares to life. Only magicians who serve as territory wardens stand between people and their worst dreams. Clementine Madigan is ready to follow in her father's footsteps as the warden of Hereswith, even though she yearns to study the wilder side of magic. Instead, she must record townspeople's nightmares so she and her father are prepared for the danger of the new moon. When her father's domain is challenged by two magicians, Clementine is drawn into a century-old conflict. She seeks revenge on one of the brothers who dueled with her father. But as she gets closer to the handsome young magician, secrets begin to rise, and Clementine, once keen on vengeance, must unite with her rival and face the realm's curse, which seems to be haunting her every turn. From acclaimed author Rebecca Ross comes a rich and nuanced story about vengeance, family, and the captivating power of dreams. Okay, next up I have The Midnight Girls by Alicia Jensika. And I think this is so pretty. Look at these edges. They're beautiful. Bella is kind of digging over there. The end pages look like this. It has a reversible jacket. And this is what the book looks like. So pretty. This says, In the snow-cloaked kingdom of Lechia, now is a time for mischief and revelry. It's carnival season, and for the next few weeks, all will be consumed with wintry balls, glittery disguises, and clavicades of nightly torchlit sleigh parties. Unbeknownst to the merrymakers, two uninvited monsters disguised as girls join the fun. Sojia and Marinka are drawn to each other the moment they meet until they discover their rivals who both have their sights set on the prince's heart. 
If one consumes a pure heart, she'll gain immeasurable power. Marinka plans to bring the prince's heart back to her patron in order to prove herself, while Zosia is determined to take his heart and its power for herself. Their ambition turns into a magical contest with both girls vying to keep the prince out of the other's grasp, even as their attraction to each other grows. But their attempts on his life draw the attention of the city that would die for him, and suddenly their escalating rivalry might cost them not just their love for each other, but both their lives. And I had to get up earlier and left the camera going, and now my battery's flashing again. So I'm going to change that out, and I will be right back. Okay, next I have Electric Idol by Katie Robert. Again, another stunning book. And it also has a reversible jacket. The end pages look like this. And the book, it looks like this. So pretty. This says, He was the most beautiful man in Olympus, and if I wasn't careful, he was going to be my death. A scorchingly hot modern retelling of Psyche and Eros that's as sinful as it is sweet. In the ultra-modern city of Olympus, there's always a price to pay. Psyche Demetriou knew she'd have to face Aphrodite's jealous rage eventually, but she never expected her literal heart to be at stake, or for Aphrodite's gorgeous son to be the one ordered to strike the killing blow. Eros has no problem shedding blood. Raised to be his mother's knife in the dark, he's been conditioned to accept that he's more monster than man. But when it comes time to take out his latest target, he can't do it. Confused by his reaction to Psyche's unexpected kindness, he does the only thing he can think of to keep her safe. He binds her to him, body and soul. Psyche didn't expect to find herself married to the glittering city's most dangerous killer, but something about Eros wakens a fire inside her she's never felt before. As lines blur and loyalties shift, Psyche realizes Eros might take her heart after all, and she's not sure she can survive the loss. Next up is Vespertine by Margaret Rogerson, and it looks like this. All of these were from the bookish box, I believe, uh, either YA or adult. I will link their information down below if you're interested. This also has a reversible jacket. This is harder to see, but there's like an imprint on the book, and it does have the sprayed edges. And the end pages look like this. This says, the dead of L'Oreal do not rest. Artemisia is training to be a gray sister, a nun who cleanses the bodies of the deceased so that their souls can pass on. Otherwise, they will rise as spirits with a ravenous hunger for the living. She would rather deal with the dead than the living, who trade whispers about her scarred hands and troubled past. When her covenant is attacked by possessed soldiers, Artemisia defends it by awakening an ancient spirit bound to a saint's relic. It's a revenant, a malevolent being that threatens to possess her the moment she drops her guard. Wielding its extraordinary power almost consumes her, but death has come to L'Oreal, and only a Vespertine, a priestess trained to wield a high relic, has any chance of stopping it. With all knowledge of Vespertine's loss to time, Artemisia turns to the last remaining expert for help, the revenant itself. As she unravels a sinister mystery of saints, secrets, and dark magic, her bond with the Revenant grows, and when a hidden evil begins to surface, she discovers that facing this enemy might require her to betray everything she has been taught to believe if the Revenant doesn't betray her first. Next is Fireheart by Emma Ham. This is so pretty. Oh, and the edges have these swords on it. It has this beautiful reversible jacket. I think it's just stunning. And then the book looks like so. Oh, and the end pages look like this. This says, They handed her a sword and bid her take, to thr take a throne. Lorelei is half-elf in a kingdom where that bloodline is synonymous with slave. The Umbra King holds everyone captive with his pet dragon, who knows no mercy. She hides in the shadows and steals to stay alive, until a rebel group gives her an offer she can't refuse. The King seeks a bride. The King seeks, seeks a bride. If she can get close enough, she could drive a dagger into that wicked man's heart. But the bridal games are more difficult than most. Lorelai must prove herself not only beautiful, but talented, poised, and deadly as the king. However, the closer she gets to saving her kingdom, the more she realizes a singular problem stands in her way. The dragon. The king's bodyguard is more than a slathering beast. He's a man. And the longer she's near him, the more she realizes that perhaps the king isn't the most dangerous person in the kingdom. Perhaps she had to guard not only her body, but her heart. For a dragon mates for life, and they're hard-pressed to give up their treasures. And then Court of Dragons, Dragon Isle Wars Book 1 by Frost K. And this one, the edges look like scales. 
and so do the end pages. Here is the reversible jacket and the book looks like this. And this says, as a daughter of the Dragon Court, Rin knows three truths. Never show weakness, pay the tithe, and never trust the elves. When the enemy strikes on the eve of her wedding, Rin has no choice but to fight. Captured, she's dragged before the elvish king and given two choices, death or marriage. She submits, biding her time as she plots and spies, determined to strike at the heart of the elvish royalty and take back her family's throne once more. But the more time she spends with her dangerous and achingly handsome husband, she finds herself wavering. Only the strong survive the hash moors of the Dragon Isles, and she can't afford to question her loyalties, leaving only one final choice. Strike hard and fast. Never waver. It's his heart or hers. Okay, and then I think the rest of these are books that I've ordered, whether they're um, used books or... I think I don't know that there's many of them that are used. I think most of them are new. Uh, and then some of them are also pre-orders. I'm gonna start with this smaller stack here. Okay, the first one I have here is It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. This says, sometimes the one who loves you is the one who hurts you the most. Lily hasn't always had it easy, but that's never stopped her from working hard for the life she wants. She's come a long way from the small town in Maine where she grew up. She graduated from college, moved to Boston, and started her own business. So when she feels a spark with a gorgeous neosurgeon named Ryle Kincaid, everything in Lily's life suddenly seems almost too good to be true. Ryle is assertive, stubborn, and maybe even a little arrogant. He's also sensitive, brilliant, and has a total soft spot for Lily. But Ryle's complete aversion to relationships is disturbing. As questions about her new relationship overwhelm her, so do thoughts of Atlas Corrigan, her first love and a link to the past she left behind. He was her kindred spirit, her protector. When Atlas suddenly reappears, everything Lily has built with Ryle is threatened. With this bold and deeply personal novel, Colleen Hoover delivers a heart-wrenching story that breaks exciting new ground for her as a writer. It Ends With Us is an unforgettable tale of love that comes at the ultimate price. Next up is The Lucky List by Rachel Lippincott. This says, Emily and her mom were always lucky. Every month, they'd take their lucky quarter and dominate Huckabee's heatedly competitive bingo night. But their luck ran out three years ago when Emily's mom succumbed to cancer, and nothing has felt right for Emily since. Now the summer before her senior year, things are getting worse. Not only has Emily wrecked her relationship with her boyfriend, Matt, but her dad is selling the house she grew up in, and he's invited Blake, his best friend's daughter, to help her give mom's things away. But that's when Emily finds the lucky list, her mom's senior year bucket list, buried in a box in the back of her closet. As Emily and Blake set off on a journey to accomplish each exciting, scary, even intimidating task, Emily begins to finally find a connection to her mom again. But she also feels a connection with Blake, one that she wasn't expecting. Suddenly, Emily must face another fear, accepting the secret part of herself she never got a chance to share with the person who knew her best. Next is Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June. This says, one, meet another gay kid. Two, fall in love with a boy. Three, lose my virginity. There's one thing Jay Coilier knows for sure. He's a statistical anomaly as the only out gay kid in his small rural Washington town. While all his friends can't stop talking about their heterosexual hookups and relationships, Jay can only dream of his own first, compiling a romantic romance to-do list of all the things he hopes to one day experience, his gay agenda. Then, against all odds, Jay's family moves to Seattle, and he starts his senior year at a new high school with a thriving LGBTQIA community. For the first time ever, Jay feels like he's found where he truly belongs. But as Jay begins crossing items off his list, he'll soon be torn between his heart and his hormones, his old friends and his new ones. Because, after all, life and love don't always go according to plan. Next is Mirrors and Ashes by Kat Bowser. And this is a fairy tales renaissance. This says, mirror, mirror on the wall, because of you, a kingdom falls. When Ember's mother makes a deal with the Fae, she betrays her own people and puts a death mark on her daughter's head. Ember has nowhere to hide. Her life falls on the kindness of dwarves. But while she finds sanctuary with the underground folk, her people suffer and will eventually succumb to the painful death that the price of magic demands, where even the soil of the earth turns to ash, unless Ember can save them. Armed with only the life lessons from her dwarven family, Ember must overthrow her own mother and discover where true love and loyalty lies. Next up is I Kissed Shara Wheeler by Casey McQuiston, and this one is a Barnes & Noble exclusive edition. And it looks like this. And the end pages look like that. This says, Chloe Green is so close to winning. She spent the four years since her mom's moved her from Southern California to Alabama for high school, dodging gossipy classmates and the puritanical administration of Willow Grove Christian Academy. The goal that's kept her going, winning valedictorian. Her only rival, prom queen, Shara Wheeler, the principal's perfect progeny. But a month before graduation, Shara kisses Chloe and vanishes. 
On a furious hunt for answers, Chloe discovers she's not the only one Shara kissed. There's also Smith, Shara's longtime quarterback sweetheart, and Rory, Shara's bad boy and neighbor with a crush. The three have nothing in common except Shara and the annoyingly cryptic notes she left behind. But together, they must untangle Shara's trail of clues to find her. It'll be worth it if Chloe can drag Shara back before graduation to beat her fair and square. Thrown in an, into an unlikely alliance, chasing a ghost through parties, break-ins, puzzles, and secrets revealed on monogram stationery, Chloe starts to suspect there might be more to this small town than she thought. And maybe, probably not, but maybe, more to Shara, too. Fierce, funny, and frank, Casey McQuiston, I kissed Shara Wheeler, is about breaking the rules, getting messy, and finding love in unexpected places. Next up is Hollow Fires by Samira Ahmed. And this says, You never forget the first time you see a dead boy. Safia Mirza dreams of becoming a journalist. And one thing she's learned as editor of her school newspaper is that a journalist's job is to find the facts and not let personal biases affect the story. But all that changes the day she finds the body of a murdered boy. Jawad Ali was 14 years old when he built a cosplay jetpack that a teacher mistook for a bomb. A jetpack that got him arrested, labeled a terrorist, and eventually killed. But he's more than a dead body and more than bomb boy. He was a person with a life worth remembering. Guided throughout her investigation by Jawad's haunting voice, Safia seeks to tell the whole truth about the murdered boy and those who killed him because of their hate-based beliefs. Through an innovative format and lyrical prose, this powerful, gripping YA novel tackles the insidious nature of racism, the terrible cost of unearthing hidden truths, and the undeniable power of hope. Perfect for fans of Sadie and Dear Martin. And I read Interment by her, and it was so, so good that when I saw she had another book coming out, without even knowing what the book was about, I pre-ordered it. Okay, let me grab this stack and move it down now. Oh, goodness. Okay, next up I have The Agathas by Kathleen Glasgow and Liz Lawson. And this says, Welcome to Castle Cove, a town cursed with missing girls, bad boyfriends, family secrets, and some very steep cliffs. Last summer, Alice Agaliev's basketball star boyfriend, Steve, dumped her. Then she disappeared for five days. She's not talking, so where she went and what happened to her is the biggest mystery in Castle Cove. Or it was, at least. Because now another one of Steve's girlfriends has vanished, Brooke Donovan, Alice's ex-best friend. And it doesn't look like Brooke will be coming back. Enter Iris Adams, Alice's tutor. Iris has her own reasons for wanting to disappear, though unlike Alice, she doesn't have the money or the means. That could be changed by the hefty reward Brooke's grandmother is offering to anyone who can share information about her granddaughter's whereabouts. The police are convinced Steve is the culprit, but Alice isn't so sure, and with Iris on her side, she just might be able to prove her theory. In order to get the reward and prove Steve's innocence, they need to figure out who killed Brooke Donovan, and luckily, Alice has exactly what they need, the complete works of Agatha Christie. If there's anyone who can teach the girls how to solve a mystery, it's the master herself. But the town of Castle Cove holds many secrets, and Alice and Iris have no idea how much danger they're about to walk into. I think this sounds so good. Oh my goodness, my battery is flashing again. I just ran it out this time. <laughs> All right, give me just a second and I'll be right back. I feel like my batteries aren't fully charging or something because they're, they're running out like really fast. Either that or they're just getting old. Okay, next up I have Bravely by Maggie Stiefvater. And this one says, to save her family, she'll have to be braver than ever before. One princess. Myrda of Dunbrock needs a change. She loves her family, jovial King Fergus, proper Queen Eleanor, the mischievous triplets, and her peaceful kingdom. But she's frustrated by its sluggishness, each day the same. Myrda longs for adventure, purpose, challenge, maybe even someday, love. Two gods. The fiery princess never expected her disquiet to manifest by a way of Frederick, Frederick, Feridoc, Feridoc, an uncanny supernatural being tasked with rooting out rot and stagnation who appears in Dunbrock on Christmas Eve with the intent to demolish the realm and everyone within. Only the intervention of the Kelich, an ancient entity of creation, gives Myrda a shred of hope, a bargain. Convince her family to change within the year or suffer the eternal consequences. Three Voyages Under the watchful eyes of the gods, Myrda leads a series of epic journeys to kingdoms near and far in an attempt to inspire revolution within her family. But in her efforts to save those she loves from ruin, has Myrda lost sight of the clan member grown most stagnant of all? herself, four seasons, that will secure the Dunbrock future, or destroy it forever. And I know this is supposed to be like a sequel to the Disney movie Brave. All right, next up is Seasonal Fears by Shawnee McGuire, and this is like a companion novel to Middle Game. This says, the King of Winter and the Queen of Summer are dead. The fight for their crown begins. 
Melanie has a destiny, though it isn't the one everyone assumes it to be. She's delicate. She's fragile. She's dying. Now truly is the winter of her soul. Harry doesn't want to believe in destiny because that means accepting the loss of the one person who gives his life meaning, who brings summer to his world. So when a new road is laid out in front of them, a road that will lead through untold dangers toward a possible lifetime together, walking down it seems to be the only option. But others are following behind, with violence in their hearts. It looks like destiny has a plan for them after all. And then there's a quote that says, One must maintain a little bit of summer, even in the middle of winter. Thoreau. Ooh, so excited for this. Next up, we have By the Book by Jasmine Galori. And I love me a bookish book, so... Sometimes, to truly know a person, you have to read between the lines. Isabel is completely lost. When she first began her career in publishing after college, she did not expect to be 25, still living at home, and one of the few black employees at her publishing house. Overworked and underpaid, constantly tore between speaking up or stifling herself, Izzy thinks there must be more to this publishing life. So when she overhears her boss complaining about a beastly high-profile author who has failed to deliver his long-awaited manuscript, Isabel sees an opportunity to prove her worth and finally get the recognition she deserves. All she has to do is go to the author's Santa Barbara mansion and give him a pep talk or three. How hard could it be? But Izzy quickly finds out she is in over her head. Bo Towers is not some celebrity lightweight writing a tell-all memoir. He is jaded and withdrawn, and it turns out just as lost as Izzy. But despite his standoffishness, Izzy needs Bo to deliver, and with her encouragement, his story begins to spill onto the page. They soon discover they have more in common than either of them expected, and as their deadline nears, Izzy and Bo begin to realize there may be something there that wasn't there before. Best-selling author Jasmine Glory's achingly romantic reimagining of a classic is a tale as old as time for a new generation. Oh, love it! Okay, next up is Book Lovers by Emily Henry. And this says, One summer, two rivals, a plot twist they didn't see coming. Nora Stevens' life is books. She reads them all. And she is not that type of heroine. Not the plucky one, not the laid-back dream girl, and especially not the sweetheart. In fact, the only people Nora is a heroine for are her clients, for whom she lands enormous deals as a cutthroat literary agent, and her beloved little sister, Libby. Which is why she agrees to go to Sunshine Falls, North Carolina, for the month of August, when Libby begs her for a sister's trip away, with visions of a small-town transformation for Nora, who she she's convinced needs to become the heroine of her own story. But instead of picnics in meadows or run-ins with a handsome country doctor or bulging four-armed bartender, Nora keeps bumping into Charlie Lastra, a bookish brooding editor from back in the city. It would be a meet cute if not for the fact that they've met many times and it's never been cute. If Nora knows she's not an ideal heroine, Charlie knows he's nobody's hero. But as they are thrown together again and again in a series of coincidences no editor worth their salt would allow, what they discover might just unravel the carefully crafted stories they've written about themselves. So cute. Okay, next up is The Nature of Witches by Rachel Griffin. And, oh, this is such a pretty book. This says, Clary Dinsmore is an everwitch. For centuries, witches have maintained the climate, their power peaking in the season of their birth, but their control is faltering as the atmosphere becomes more erratic. All hope lies with Clara, whose rare magic is tied to every season. In autumn, Clara wants nothing to do with her power. It's wild and volatile, and the price of her magic, losing the one she loves, is too high, despite the need to control the increasingly dangerous weather. In winter, the world is on the precipice of disaster. Fires burn, storms rage, and Clara finally accepts that she's the only one who can make a difference. In spring, she falls for saying, the witch training her. As her magic grows, so do her feelings for him, until she's terrified saying will be the next one she loses. In summer, Clara must choose between her power and her happiness, her duty and the people she loves, before she loses everything. From a stunning new voice comes a story about a powerful witch who must decide if using her volatile magic to help the world is worth the price of losing the person she loves the most. Next up is An Honest Lie by Taryn Fisher. This says, I'm going to kill her. You better come if you want to save her. Lorraine, Rainey, lives at the top of Tiger Mountain. Remote, moody, cloistered in pine trees and fog. It's a sanctuary, a new life. She can hide from the disturbing path she wants to forget, if she's allowed to. When Rainey reluctantly agrees to a girls' weekend in Vegas, she's prepared for an exhausting parade of shots and slot machines. But after a wild night, her friend Braith doesn't come back to the hotel room. And then Rainey gets the text message sent from Braith's phone. Someone has her. But Rainey is who they really want, and Rainey knows why. 
What follows is a twisted, shocking journey on the knife's edge of life and death. If Rainy wants to save Braith and herself, the only way is to step back into the past. Da -da -da. Next up is For Your On Good by Samantha Downing. And this one says, A bold, sneaky thriller is set at a prestigious private school complete with interfering parents, over-eager students, and one teacher who just wants to teach them all a lesson. Teddy Crutcher has won Teacher of the Year at the prestigious Belmont Academy, home to the best and brightest. He says his wife would, couldn't be more proud, though no one has seen her in a while. Teddy really can't be bothered with a few mysterious deaths on campus that are looking more and more like murder, or the student digging a little too deep into Teddy's personal life. His main focus is pushing these kids into their full academic potential. All he wants is for his colleagues and the endlessly meddlesome parents to stay out of his way. If not, well, they'll get what they deserve. It's really too bad that sometimes excellence can come at such a high cost. Then I have Electra by Jennifer Saint. This is also such a pretty cover. The end pages look like this. Beautiful. This says, a beautiful and lyrical retelling from Jennifer Saint, the Sunday Times bestselling author of Ariadne. The house of Atreus is cursed, a bloodline tainted by a generational cycle of violence and vengeance. This is a story of three women, their fates inextricably tied to this curse and the fickle nature of men and gods. Clytemnestra, the sister of Helen, wife of Agamemnon, her hopes of averting the curse are dashed when her sister is taken to Troy by the feckless Paris. Her husband raises a great army against them and determines to win whatever the cost. Cassandra, princess of Troy and cursed by Apollo to see the future but never to be believed when she speaks of it, she is powerless in her knowledge that the city will fall. Electra, the youngest daughter of Clytemnestra and Ag Agamemnon, Electra is horrified by the bloodletting of her kin, but can she escape the curse, or is her own destiny also bound in violence? And then last, but certainly not least, I've got the hardcover of Lore Olympus Volume 1 by Rachel Smythe, and this is a graphic novel, and I've heard amazing things about this, and told that I absolutely need to read it. This says, scandalous gossip, wild parties, and forbidden love. Witness what the gods do after dark in this stylish and contemporary reimagining of one of mythology's best-known stories from creator Rachel Smythe. Persephone, young goddess of spring, is new to Olympus. Her mother, Demeter, has raised her in the mortal realm, but after Persephone promises to train as a sacred virgin, she's allowed to live in the fast-moving, glamorous world of the gods. When her roommate, Artemis, takes her to a party, her entire life changes. She ends up meeting Hades and fills an immediate spark with the charming yet misunderstood ruler of the underworld. Now Persephone must navigate the confusing politics and relationships that rule Olympus, while also figuring out her own place and her own power. This edition of Smythe's original Eisner-nominated webcomic, Lore Olympus, features a brand new exclusive short story and brings the Greek Pantheon into the modern age in a sharply perceptive and romantic graphic novel. And I am very excited to read this. Okay, so those are all of the books that I have acquired since my last haul. Maybe some that I did include in the last haul, I don't know. Have you guys read any of them? Did you like them? Did you not? Comment down below and let me know. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, click that subscribe button down below. And until next time, remember to always be completely you.